Welcome back to the Early Way In Podcast. First pay-per-view of 2024, heading to Toronto, Canada this Saturday for UFC 297. We've got two title fights up for grabs here. Uh, co-main event first, we got Raquel Pennington versus Myra Buena Silva. It's for the bank or the vacant UFC Bantamweight strap there. Um, and then what everybody's most invested in, man, our main event at 185, we got the title fight between Sean Strickland and Drickless Duplessis. A lot of bad blood pulled up to this fight here. Real excited for it. A lot of Canadians seem to be put in a good spot this weekend, like most pay-per-views as well. Um, not waste any time, man. Let's get down to business. Let you wrap up uh, how we finished last week. And we'll jump into jump into this card. Uh, yeah. So last week, a little bit mixed bag of results for, between the two of us. Uh, we look at your card. You swept the card outside of me convincing you to take Ricky Simone, dude. Uh, would have been a little bit above <laughs> a four-unit night. Uh, but you you were on the Fareed Basher at line, um, the Ferreira by TKO round one plus two thirty. I think I actually tried to talk you off of that one too. Just yeah, you know, it wasn't a great line for trying to call the exact round and method. Um, but that that was uh, easy work, man. I guess Phil Haas needs to hang it up. Yeah. Um, and then the parlay between Ankeliyev and McGee. I thought both of those were good parlay pieces, and he ended up the night plus two point nine six units. Uh, looking over at my card. Rough straight picks for sure. Um, my man, the first bet that I made on the card was two units at plus one, 114 from Jim Miller. You were on it as well. Um, that was the only one that I should have played. I probably should have just left it at that, but uh, started looking for spots. Ricky Simone definitely let me down. Um, I guess I just underrated the Mario Bautista and what he's been able to do with the opponents that were put in front of him. You know, I can't pick his level of competition, but he's certainly shown up in the times. Uh, that he needed to and showed that he's a he's a lot better than I thought he was. Um, let's see. Uh, fight ends by sub on the Joshua Van versus Felipe Boone's fight at plus 270. I'd play that again. I think you give Boone's a few more seconds at the end of round one. He could have done something with that. And uh, Joshua Van, after Boone started melting, you know, there was uh, – there were some opportunities for him. I think he even tried to go for an ankle lock or something at one I was point. About to say that, yeah, <laughs> wasn't wasn't the smartest move, but he did try and go for it. Um, so yeah, ended up the night minus four point oh seven units. Like I said, that Jim Miller uh, win definitely saved my night from a pretty horrific night. Uh, minus four units, not the way I wanted to start the year, but some I can come back from for sure. Most definitely. Let's see. We'll get started. First fight of the prelims. We start in the uh, shit. Flyweight division, Malcolm Gordon taking on Jimmy Flick. Uh, this is not uh, the type of fighters that you want to be laying a lot of money on. Uh, the way I look at it, I think that Malcolm Gordon, um, he has at least a couple of, of decent UFC caliber wins and the losses that he has uh, faced in the UFC. They're against fighters that I wouldn't expect either of these guys to to win against. Um, you look at the Muhammad Makayev fight, he... Takes the fight to round three. He's actually made it somewhat competitive against a, a you know, renowned prospect in Mohamed Mikhaev. Um, and then him actually going three rounds against uh, Francisco Figueredo. Uh, I think that that shows that he can at least do it over 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. For Jimmy Flick, uh, definitely some ups and downs in his career. Don't really know where he's at mentally as far as uh, retirement or how, how dedica- dedicated he is to the sport. Um to me, it seems like he's he's a sub or bust type of guy. Uh, when he does lose, he loses badly. Um, I think the under on this fight and uh, fight ends by submission are kind of the two that I'm looking at if I'm going to play it. The only way that that happens is if it's a, a great number. But as far as trying to pick a side on this fight, I'm not really sold on either guy to get my money behind. Yeah, I... Uh... Never thought I'd see the day that Malcolm Gordon gets put in a winnable fight. You know, I think after saying thank you to a to enough hard challenges, UFC is trying to trying to do him a favor here in his home country. You know, I, I both the guys are pretty similar. They're post thirty flyweights. You know, they got the diminishing durability. I think they both would consider themselves primary grapplers first. Well, I I feel like Flick is a little bit more opportunistic with this submission game. I think Malcolm is a more uh, put together fighter here. Um, you know, Flick is never. I don't think Flick has a single TKO victory in his in his twenty three fights, and that seems to be the real downfall for Malcolm Gordon. I know he's been submitted, I think, a couple times too. But in the UFC, we're talking about Makayev and Albazi. You know, really, really top ranked one twenty five ers. I don't necessarily trust Jimmy Flick to find that submission. 
And if you take the submission game away from Jimmy Flick, I don't think the guy has much left. His striking is very, very poor. I don't think he has any type of wrestling. The the pre-retirement coming back, he just looks frail, man. Um, I, I really do think like the Figueredo fight, we could see Malcolm Gordon wind up on top here, use his wrestling. So he's the side that I, that I think I pretty convincingly come to. And earlier in the week, was actually kind of debating Malcolm Gordon, but I was just checking it earlier, man. He's been bet up to almost, almost it's minus 185, almost two to one on Malcolm Gordon. So missing the number, you know, pretty volatile fight like this. You got a fly white sitting at an under, you know, under one and a half and it's, you got to lay juice to hit it here. So, you know, I think it's an exciting fight, but uh, where, where the numbers are, I'm on Malcolm Gordon's side, but I, I do think it's going to be an easy pass for me to sit back and just enjoy this one. Moving on up to the women's 125, where we got Jasmine Jesuda Vicious taking on Priscilla Cachoeira. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to lay the minus 350, minus 400 on Jasmine here, but a, another Canadian that I do think is in a really, really good spot to win. Priscilla is one of these girls who's always been pretty much KO or bust um, in the UFC. That's not a style that you typically like to back in women's MMA. Women's MMA. She seems to have not much minute winning ability. Of the two, I think she's far less durable than Jasmine and shown time and time again that she can get out grappled here. So, if, you know, if Jasmine's smart whatsoever, I think she could dominate this fight from top position. What she's shown me in the Miranda Maverick fight and even the Tracy Cortez fight, um, it's a pretty – I think it's enough here to, to get through Cachoeira. The one kind of worry for me, you know, Jasmine, I think she's going to have plenty of opportunities to finish this fight, but historically in the past she's not the most potent finisher. I don't think it's Gina Mazzani all over again, but Priscilla does – She's there for 15 minutes. She's trying to take your head off. Um, the under two and a half is plus 130. You know, I think that's generous for a Priscilla fight. And then the then the amount of time I think that she's going to find herself on bottom with, with Jasmine on top, looking to get her first UFC finish here in front of her crowd. I like Jasmine to get on top and finish this fight. So I got a unit on the, on the under two and a half at plus 130. I thought that was the best way I saw value here in this fight. You're muted. Yeah, I'd have to uh, agree with you as far as this does look an, look like an opportunity for Jazz Davicious to get that first UFC finish. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, I, I'm, I might even be looking more towards Jazz Davicious uh, by decision. I'm not really sure what that prop looks like, but that's how I see it happening. Priscilla. I don't know. I don't know where she is at her career. I uh, didn't look into this fight too much, but uh, I feel like Jasmine's the side. Obviously, there's a there's an opportunity for, for Priscilla to catch her on the feet, but uh, Jasmine's shown some pretty good durability in her fights up till this point. So um, I'm on the Jasmine Jazdavicious side, probably by decision, um, but I, I certainly see how the under can cover some of the upside for uh, Jasmine and Priscilla here. So I don't mind that at all. Moving up to the welterweight division, Johan Lioness taking on Sam Patterson. Um, you know, this is another fight where I think that they have put a Canadian fighter in a good spot to win. Yeah. Uh, Johan Lioness, I think that his win condition is a little bit more one-dimensional than Sam Patterson, which is a little concerning. I think Sam Patterson, <clears throat> this is his first time at welterweight in his professional career, but he uh, did, I think, almost all of his amateur career at 170, so it's not unfamiliar territory. Yeah. Um, he certainly has the frame to support a welterweight uh, you know, fight at six foot three. Um, as far as where they are in their career, uh, I would say that Sam Patterson still adding quite a bit to his game. Lioness, on the other hand, he's looked really good. They just matched him up with some uh, decent competition in Mike Mallett. I'm not really sure um, how he was going to win that fight, to be honest right. with you. But even the uh, the other UFC win that he has against Darian Weeks, it's by split. Um, I would like to see a little bit more uh, convincing win under the UFC banner before I start backing him at uh, favorite odds. But I do think that you know this is a setup fight for him. Um, it's just whether or not that he can take advantage of it. Yeah. I was able to part with uh, with one unit on line S at minus 145. I, like you said, I do think they're trying what they can to get this guy back on track after losing to him a lot. And I do think he's the one here, um, you know, who who has the, the, the potential to look like the big favorite here early on in this fight. Patterson's coming off like a real nasty TKO loss to, you know, Ashmoose, one where he was 
wrestling Mark Goddard afterwards. And, you know, the guy, especially at 155 for the frame, his striking defense, he was a bad TKO waiting to happen. And, you know, you look at topology that he was scheduled to fight Nazareth Akprast at 155 again um, just a couple months ago. And I don't know if, if he's decided 155 is enough for him or if the UFC, again, trying to do Johan a favor, giving them somebody who's not typically a welterweight, you know, coming up here to fight him. My one one problem with Line S, though, um, and why, you know, I don't necessarily regret the play, but uh, backing him at chalk is a little bit scary is because of the one-dimensional that you talked about, and sometimes he can be a little bit low volume looking for that TKO. But mm-hmm. if he lands, I, I really – I don't trust Sam Patterson to eat it. Um, it's not just the Ashmos fight that you see him hurt in. You've seen him hurt on the regional scene a couple times. When I go back and watch Johan's fights with Evan Cutts, with Jer- Jared Burleson on uh, – Justin Burleson on um, Dana White's Contender Series, I think those are guys on Sam Patterson's level, guys that, you know, that I think Linus can put away as well. When you go back and watch the Weeks fight, Weeks takes some bombs, man. Gabe Green gets dropped hard in round one and comes back with that gas tank. Any of these shots I do think are, are ones that put Sam Patterson away. Um, I think the finishing upside – all the way on Johan Linus here. So at minus 145, I think there's potential that um, that he covers that pretty easily in the first round. So I wanted to go ahead and take a shot on him there. First women's fight? No, nope. second women's fight. 115 here. We got Jillian Robertson taking on Pollyanna Vienna. Um, this is a fight where I did hit the under two and a half at minus 130. Um, Really big on Julian Roberson here, man. I honestly think she could she could cover this minus two hundred price tag. Stylistically, I think it's a phenomenal fight for her. When you see what she struggles with, she struggled with these younger, more physical girls who can negate that grappling. You know, Barber, Maverick, Talia Santos, Tabitha Ricci, like strong girls who can you know who are grapplers first themselves. To me, Pollyanna is not that. Uh, what I see Pollyanna struggle with is girls who want to take her down. You know, her last three losses. She's been subbed in two of them. She was taken down five times in the other one. And you can always trust Gillian Robertson to shoot in these fights. That's one thing that's that's kind of easy um, going into back her. Is she she never lets her fights play out on the feet. She's always shooting the takedowns. You look at some of their similar opponents, Hannah Cyphers, Veronica Hardy beating Pollyanna Vienna. Gillian Robertson dispatches them both by submission early in the fight. Um, so, yeah, I'm all over Gillian Robertson to get this fight down to the mat, probably finish Pollyanna Viana. But on Polly's side, you know, she's a she's an inside the distance or bust girl. All 13 wins of hers have been inside the distance. And so if she's going to get the job done. I think she gets it on the, um, you know, arm bar from bottom or, you know, the more powerful strikes on the feet. So ultimately, I thought minus 130. I don't want too much exposure on a female fight, but I think this fight goes under at a pretty high clip, man. Um, yeah, I haven't really thought about the over under on this fight, but uh, I see potential for both girls for sure. Um, truthfully, I think that there's a lot of upside on the Pollyanna Vienna side. I think that if it stays on the feet, she's the more dangerous of the two striking. She'll win damage as far as the judge's eyes. Um, she does have a fight IQ problem where she can end up on her back and that's obviously where Jillian wants to take this. It's just a matter of if she has the the wrestling to keep it there. You talked about Pollyanna still being dangerous, even if she is in the most advantageous position for Jillian Robertson. Um, so in my eyes, you know, I'm seeing that if this is on the feet, Pollyanna um, might have a slight edge, um, certainly in damage. And then even if it's on the ground, like she's still uh, subject to to find a finish. Um, I think at this point, the line's kind of gotten out of hand, um, especially when I can make cases for Pollyanna getting a finish both on the feet and on the ground. Um, so <clears throat> just where the bias. line's from, a what was bias that? coming into play. Maybe a little bias, maybe <laughs> a little bias. Pollyanna, I'm always going to lean towards her. Um, but I, I do think that she's, uh, you know, I think she's being a little disrespected as the line's gone up. Uh, during the week what are we sitting at now um yeah minus the minus 250 like you give me plus 200 or better on Pollyanna Vienna like I wouldn't be surprised if I tossed a unit her way um especially with the the upside of uh, a finish um good being on on her side I know you know Jillian if she gets her to the ground and gets that top pressure she's a leech and she could definitely uh wrap something up Pollyanna 
maybe not the most defensively sound on the ground. So the under, yeah, the more I talk about it, yeah, that could be the uh, the side for sure. But if the money line of, Bal- of Pollyanna Vienna continues to, to get wider, uh, I think that that might be the side here. Uh, moving up to... I just don't know. Wait, uh, to the bantamweight division, Sid Serhe City versus Ramon Tavares. This is a rematch from their contender series mm-hmm. bout. Um, I watched their contender series match, and I like the tenacity of Ramon Tavares. Um, I do think that if he isn't able to find an early knockout, that City starts to put together his offense. He was able to find that shot, and yeah, it was stopped a little bit early. Um, but I do think that he's the cleaner striker out of the two. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not really sure if Ramon's going to take a, a little bit of a back step as far as that that pressure forward after just getting knocked out. He might try and sit on it a little bit. And I think that that would actually be a disadvantage to him. Um, I'm probably on the sit he side here. Uh, there's not enough on either guy for me to want to lay juice on the side, uh, on the sit he side. But uh, I do think that he's the who I'm going to be going with here. It's any, like, anything like the first one, man, they're going to get after it quick. First one was, first one was, um, was fire from the get go. I, um, I think, I think my gut is, is on the CD side as well, but when you run a rematch back, you know, you got one guy here who's itching to get it back. The other guys, I've already knocked this guy out. Why am I got to fight him again? You know, I just I kind of feel like there could be some value on Ramon Tavares. It's because it, it's not like he wasn't landing his left hand, you know, in the first fight. He's stupid accurate with his boxing. It's very crisp, and he was finding the home for his left hand. I just I felt like there was such a speed disadvantage for him. I thought CD was so much faster, um, and if at kicking range, it was CD's fight all day. Um, I ultimately think even if you know even if CD doesn't set him down. With the punches, man, he was setting up the head kick so good. I mean, he started landing kicks to the body that I really thought were dropping Ramon Tavares' hands, and I almost see Ramon getting slept with the head kick here. You know, they're opposite stances, but Ramon's, you know, Ramon's a southpaw, but he's he's all boxing. So CD's the one throwing the kick. He has that advantage with their open stances. So, you know, where I, where I see values one way, but I, I don't think I can get to it, man. Um, my gut tells me that that CD's going to get this done with the head kick. So. Lock that in. Uh, CD knockout with the head kick, man. I think we're on the same side with another Canadian there. One other thing. I also like the over one and a half here. I don't know what it's set at, but I'd assume it's set at over uh, the over under one and a half. And I'd yeah. be looking at the over here. So it's minus, it's pick them pretty much minus 115 both ways on cool. DraftKings. So yeah, that's not, that's not a bad look as well, man. A uh, decent number for, for Bantam weights. Already seen their weapons once before as well. Could be a little bit more timid this time around. Yeah, I think that's a good look. Move on up to the 145 pound division where we see Charles Jordan taking on taking on Sean Woodson. You know, I see a lot of people who did get Jordan at Pickums, and I do think that that was probably a good bet. But sitting around minus 200, I don't think I don't think there's a lot of value on Charles Jordan left. Man, uh, one thing to note about both of them, you know, they're both. Uh, victims to Julian Erosa's come from behind round three Darce choke. Uh, just something I wanted to note in there. Uh, when I see these two guys, you know, I see a fight that's largely going to play out on the feet. Um, and I just think Jordan's a bit more durable. I think Jordan's a bit faster. He's definitely seen the better competition. He's got the hometown crowd behind him. But man, that length of Woodson, I, I do think could really cause Jordan some issues. Um, he fights really well behind the jab. He's got good boxing combinations and defensively speaking, Jordan is is not the best when he's entering the pocket. And I do think there's going to be times where he gets touched up here. I don't know, man. You know, if anybody's going to mix it up, I, I do think Jordan's the one to initiate the takedowns. He's had a couple guillotines lately, but I, I don't necessarily rate – I don't necessarily rate Jordan's wrestling – much better than like a use of Zalal. And statistically speaking, Zalal went two for 17 on takedown attempts against Woodson. He just fought Dennis Bazooka, who I also think is a primary wrestler, a primary grinder who would like to get on the inside. And what Sean Woodson looked great, man. So as this line continues to climb, I do think the fight plays out very, very close. Jordan's just, 
I don't know. He's a guy that kind of typically struggles to cover a big price tag here. So I'm thinking there's some value on Sean Woodson at this point. Um, I just I don't know if I have the balls to take it because I do think there's a chance I get burnt on the scorecards in a close fight. I'm gonna take Sean, I'm gonna take Sean Woodson as the underdog though. Yeah, I think um, I think Woodson is really good. I think you know obviously the biggest concern is Charles Jordan's Jordan's pressure, um, especially mm-hmm. in the later rounds. Um, like you talked about the Arosa finish, I think that Charles Jordan's game plays into that really well. Um, but on the feet, uh, truthfully, I think Woodson's going to piece him up. Uh, he's a much cleaner striker. Um, I'm with you on this being a close fight that goes to the scorecard. So the over two and a half at minus 150, don't love laying it, but that's uh, that's also kind of how I'm looking at playing this fight. It's a uh, it should be a really, really good fight. And if there were any chin issues on the Jordan side, I'd look to play Sean Woodson a little bit more. But Woodson, kind of in my head, known as a pillow fisted type of fighter. And Jordan has a really, really solid chin. He's never right. been knocked out. So it's tough to bank on that. So for both those reasons, I think it'll hit the over. And minus 150 for the over isn't, isn't so bad, in my opinion. I actually like that too, man. <clears throat> Um, let's see. Okay, moving up to the prelim main event, Brad Katona versus Garrett Armfield. Um, I'm pretty sure that you have a little bit more of a better read on this fight than I do. Um, I, I, I like Katona. I think that maybe whenever we talked about the ultimate fighter, like I, I think we picked him to win the ultimate yeah. fighter. He, um, he's pretty good all around. I think early he has an issue with setting settling into a fight, and I think uh, Garrett Armfield throws straight enough and hard enough early that he could find a KO and, and really bust up some some parlays this week. Um, so Armfield KO one is how I've looked at this fight, but I'm not sure I trust Armfield even you know down at his at his true weight class at 135 with a full camp. Um, I'm not sure that he can keep up that type of uh, output that we just saw Brad Katona do in his last fight. Mm -hmm. Um, He'll continue with that pressure. And even though he might drop that first round, I do expect him to start pouring it on in the later rounds. Um, So I give Katona the cardio edge and um, the experience edge. But I do think that Armfield's getting a little disrespected here. He, he throws really, really hard straight punches and Katona eats punches in that first round. Um, I, I think that he could, he could definitely fall to Armfield in that, in that first one. But uh, I don't know for, a, for an actual pick. Um, I'll probably go with Katona. I think he's the more well-rounded of the two. So I'll go with him, but would not surprise me if he gets starched in round one. I hate hearing that from you because, yeah, I uh, I feel really good about Brad Katona this week. I've, I've hit him for a total of two and a half units at minus 178, minus 188. Um, I don't expect, expect it to be the most exciting prelim main event, honestly, but uh, but I do feel like I have a really good read on it. Outside of, of punching power early on, um, I don't really see much advantages for Garrett Armfield in this fight. You know, who's the A side here for me? It's Brad Katona, the the two time tough winner, put in the prelim main event in his home country. It's to boost him up in my eyes. You know, fight IQ wise, it man, it's some of the best. Like he just knows how to win a fight. He knows how to grind them out, even if it's up at 145 pounds. The guy's durable shit. He's never been finished in his 15 pro fights. He's he's exited the UFC, grinded his way back. You know, the level of comp, it's, it's laughable. You got a guy here who's beaten Kyler Phillips, who's beaten Bryce Mitchell, Timur Valiev, you know, over a guy in Garrett Armfield who was pretty sure beating like an 0-0 guy with two fights before coming into the UFC. I, I just expect him to do what he does best, man. I, I think he skirts around the outside. I think he mixes in a couple takedowns. I think he's real smart with his entries. He knows how to win rounds, knows how to get those takedowns late in the fight, and I think there's a massive cardio advantage here, like you said. Um, you know, and you, you kind of reference referencing Ricky Simone last week and referencing the Mirab, how he went to it. It's kind of like back in that in that stage. You know, you just know it's going to go to a decision, but you know you got a guy who's going to always stick to the game plan, a guy who's going to shoot those takedowns, and I got a guy who's never been finished in 15 pro fights. So 
I'm really confident on Brad. I uh, just hope it, you know, hope the fight plays out exactly like I'm thinking. We're on to the to the pay per view already, man, and they're kicking it off um, with a killer fight, man, between Arnold Allen and Mavzar Evloev. You got a 19 and two guy versus a 17 and 0 legit prospects trying to, you know, really trying to to bounce or put their name into the title hat. You know, Arnold Allen, man, the Max Holloway. I didn't realize this. That was that was the first loss in a decade for Arnold Allen. You know, the guy had put together nine victories over 10 years and there's no shame into losing to Max Holloway. Uh, my biggest concern though, watching tape back, looking at opponents, man, you know, there's Allen's never faced a wrestler of this caliber at all, man. And I don't think he's going to deal well with this style of fight. You can really only bring in comparisons early in his UFC days to Mads Burnell, um, Mach one Americani. And even those guys, I think they're submission first guys. Um, whereas Mavzar is a whole lot better traditional wrestler, can chain takedown attempts together, has better control on the mat. And British grappling as a whole, not high on, you know. My uh another thing, Arnold's frame. You know, I really do think that sure it looked good over five rounds striking with Max, but when you're made to work, when you're made to dig off takedowns up against the fence, I don't think the frame he carries is going to be too well. I think Mobsar takes round three at a very, very high clip here. I think Arnold could be a little bit timid to let his hands go seeing these takedowns come back. You got a guy with Mobsar who just dealt with Diego Lopez, who was like one of the most dangerous guys on the mat that you're going to see. I, I don't expect Arnold Allen to offer much off his back when he gets there. Looking back at Arnold Allen's last three, I know how you feel up against uh, Zodik Yusuf. How well, shit what he just proved to me in his Edson Barboza first uh, main event. Not too high on him going forward, you know. Then you see Dan Hooker killing himself to 145. You see the Cater injury early in a fight. There's just not Arnold Allen's not really showed me a lot. He showed me that he's tough enough to to take on Max Holloway and just kind of get outpointed over five rounds. But I don't think he's going to defend these takedowns very well, man. Um, kind of like Katona, you just kind of you just kind of know you're going to get a decision with Mobs are, but I think it's a pretty clear unanimous decision victory. Um, I like that wrestling to go to work on Saturday. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I share a lot of the same same ideas about this fight. Uh, I think that Allen's super tough, really physically gifted, but I do think he's yeah, he's at a pretty significant skill disadvantage here. Uh, Mavs are unlike Mads Burnell. He's not going to slow down with that takedown offense. Exactly. Um, and then he also has a stand-up game that's really good at neutralizing the offense of his opponents. And I think that Allen, in the times where he is able to keep the fight on the feet, he's going to also have to figure out Mavsar's jab before he can start to get off his offense of his own. Um, it's really hard to see this going anyway, but Evloev decision – um, obviously Allen is powerful enough to make things interesting if he catches him on the feet. Um, but that's just a really tough ask whenever you get into the upper echelon of featherweight fighters. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm on the Mavsar Evloev side here. I, I think that even though he, he might be at a slight disadvantage on the feet, I think he has enough tools to negate the offensive pressure of Allen. And then whenever it comes to shooting for takedowns, he's going to be outworking Allen. Um, even if neither of them are getting off much offense, I think that it'll be hard to argue that Evloev edges this out. Um, it's whether or not you want to pay. Um, uh, I don't even what's his what's his it's line. It's pretty much two to one now. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Do you want to pay two to one to bank on the judges scoring uh, a fight correctly when you know that there's probably not going to be much damage done on either side? Um, that's something that you got to take into account because you're you know Evloev is not. A finisher and Arnold Allen so tough. I don't think that this will be the fight that he can um, find that that finish. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go with Evloev, but I, I'll probably stay away from it. Uh, moving up the fight card, 185 pounds, Chris Curtis versus Mark Andre Barriou. Um Man, I, I want to get on the Chris Curtis side with you, uh, but it's a little tough. You know, every Chris Curtis fight I think is really tough to call if he's not at. Um, some underdog odds, you know, like whenever you're paying for Chris Curtis, you have to know that coming into the fight, you're the smaller of the two. Um, I imagine that if MAB gets on top, he can remain on top. Um, Chris Curtis is going to make him work, but he only has to do this for 15 minutes. Um, Curtis is also the only guy that's lost to <laughs> Kelvin Gastelum in the past three years. Um, I know Gastelum was fighting Sean Brady last time out, but he certainly didn't look um, 
didn't look the best. So I, I kind of still wonder where, uh, what level Chris Curtis is, you know, he came into the UFC and got the big upset against Phil Hawes. But as we've seen that, that win hasn't aged the best. Yeah. Um, I, I think MAB is a little bit inconsistent, um, but he is a solid all around fighter and just having the size advantage. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if Chris Curtis is going to be able to melt him over, over 15 minutes. Uh, I think that this will be another close fight. Not necessarily one I want to lay juice on the uh, favorite, but I do like Chris Curtis in this fight. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm on the Chris Curtis side here for two units. You know, not really static about going against the home crowd here on a pay per view, but I do. I do think it's a good spot for him. Um, you know, it may be as a guy who likes to get on the inside and box, um, and I think Chris Curtis is one of the best. Um, inside boxers, best one of the best counter boxers um, in the weight class. And I think he does a really good job of keeping people off of him. He has tremendous takedown defense. I don't really, you know, I don't really think he's going to get stalled out on the fence here. I think he takes a lot of uh, MAB's game away from him. When I look at MAB as well, it's like, you know, Oscar Pejota, you know, he popped in that one, but no longer in the UFC. Abu Azaitar. I don't think I think he fought this past year, the first time since he lost to Mark Andre, just completely irrelevant, likely out of the UFC. Dolce Lugiambula out of the UFC. Jordan Wright out of the UFC. Julian Marquez probably on his way out. And then the general consensus from most everybody is he lost that Eric Condor's fight. You know, it just kind of left it close going to the decision. Um, and it was up for grabs there. I just there's not a win where he's ever ran away from it, and I, I think if he goes out here and beats Chris Curtis, it's easily um, the best win in his career. Um, but I I just don't see how he necessarily does. I mean, I think uh, Curtis keeps up with him in the volume. I think Curtis is, I think Curtis is, I think they're both extremely durable. But you do see, you know, Mark Andre uh, being finished in his last two losses. So I kind of do lean toward Chris Curtis having the durability edge. I don't know, kind of benefits in being uh, in camp with the champs, John Strickland, <clears throat> on the same card as him. You know, I, there's there's times where if this fight is solely playing out on the feet, which I think it does because of his takedown defense, I think I can get to 67, 68% here on, um, on Chris Curtis. So I got minus 165. I'm on the right side of some line movement. Just, you know, hoping the read's there on Saturday, man. We are at our featured uh, bout on the pay-per-view. We got – you know, Magny taking on proper Mike Malott. Tell you time and time again, Magny is, you know, looking through, you know, uh, bet MMA. It's probably my one of my most profitable fighters of all time. I've cashed on him against Lee the Leech, D Rod, Rocco Martin, Phil Rowe, Max Griffin. Um, you know, the last two I kind of wanted to go back to with Phil Rowe and Max Griffin. It's he's really struggling to run away with these fights that I think he should um, nowadays. It's, you know, and you got guys like, it was it Shaft Cat, Burns, Ian Gary. Like anytime he thinks he might still have it in the top 10 of the division, he gets ran through. You know, he's 37 years old with a ton of fight miles on him. And I do think outside of his cardio, I do think the it's pretty evident, evident that the decline, the decline's there for Neil Magny, man. So I think in the pocket, I think Mike Malott's going to be a lot sharper. I think he's a lot stronger in the clinch area as well, which is where Magny really likes to take this fight. Um, submission upside. All the way on Mike Malad, I would say 90, 95% of the finishing upside in this fight goes to Mike Malad here as well. He's finished all five of his UFC wins with four of those inside the first round, I believe. You know, it's hard for me to not see a world where Mike Malad doesn't get him down, get the guillotine, get the arm triangle. So I don't I don't see much value Um on the money line, I think you take Mike Malott early, Mike Malott inside the distance, or you wait to potentially see if this fight gets hairy and play play Neil Magny live. So I think those are the best two ways to play it. But uh, ultimately, I, I do think Neil Magny is going to get finished here, probably submitted on Saturday. Uh, you sound more confident than I, I would be. It, I think that this fight is kind of a litmus test for Mike Mallett to where he fits in the <clears> – <throat> in the upper echelon of the welterweight division you know you look at neil magny's losses and they're they're gary burns shaft cat um yeah. but his wins are, are honestly like pretty good man like jeff neal max griffin daniel rodriguez phil rowe i would certainly put mike mallet somewhere in between the four wins and the four losses and i'm not really sure where he edges out right there mm -hmm. um you aged my boy magny he's only 36 okay he might still have <laughs> some life in him 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think that, like I said, that this is a, a true test to see where Mike Mallett fits into the division. I think that this is the first guy that the UFC's lined him up with that I think can drag this fight out over 15 minutes, which would be a lot of really useful information to try and cap Mike Mallett in the future. Um, yeah. For now, though, I think that the line's a little wild. Like, I, I honestly do. It's not that Neil Magny's winning these fights against Rowe, um, like Phil Rowe and uh, Max Griffin specifically, um, convincingly, but he certainly knows how to make them close. And that's kind of been his his thing, is he, he understands how to make fights awkward, he is usually um, pretty good about dragging fights out. And so that that's how, how, to, how I'm looking at this fight is just as an opportunity to get some more information on Mike Malott. Um, but no bet for me. I'll pick Mike for the sake of the, the podcast, though. Let's see. Uh, we go to the, <laughs> to the co-main event of the evening, the vacant bantamweight championship between Raquel Pennington and Myra Buena Silva. Um, Man, I, I did not do that much research on this fight. I feel like I kind of have it down just looking at it. Um, truthfully, I think that there's a lot of upside for Pennington to get some cage control. I watched back the uh, Lena Landsberg fight with Myra Bueno Silva. And for the time that Landsberg was uh, still had still had gas in the tank, she was able to hold up Silva on the fence for some significant minutes. And uh, that's kind of Raquel Pennington's game, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see much finishing upside for Raquel Pennington, but I do think that she has to close the distance to be successful, and that's kind of where Mayra Bueno Silva shines. So whether it's pulling guard or, um, you know, fi finding a way, I think over 25 minutes, Mayra Bueno Silva is going to be given the opportunity to lock up a submission um, on Raquel Pennington. Outside of that, I think that there's a some upside for Raquel Pennington to just pressure up against the cage, win some minutes, and mm -hmm. uh, get a super shitty decision. Um, the only way that this fight is is any way interesting and you know makes people believe that somebody's earned this fight or earn, earned the the title is if we see a Silva submission. And mm -hmm. I'm not really sure if I want to bet on that. Uh, or what. So uh, I'll go Bueno Silva uh, to get the submission over the 25 minutes. Um, I'm curious to see if she still can maintain a submission threat past 15 minutes. You know, I'm not really sure how she'll look in those championship rounds. Um, mm -hmm. She does tend to slow, and I think that she lacks a little bit of the wrestling to get the fight to where she wants. So that's some concerns coming into the Bueno Silva side. But uh, I'll, I'll pick Silva. Any finishing equity on Raquel at all? Uh, I think that, you know, not knowing what Bueno Silva looks like past the 15 minute mark, uh, that's where that's where there's some some question marks for me and where I know that Raquel can put together a, a 25 minute fight. We've seen it in the past. She's uh, she's always been a hard worker. <laughs> you know, that's not something I like to bet on, but that is something that she has going for her in this fight where I think that there's a few unknowns on the Bueno Silva side. Wanda four and a half unders minus one Oh five, pretty much getting the whole fight there for a finish. That's why I ask. I, I honestly, I can't make a, a case for Raquel Pennington getting the finish, but I, I kind of like, you know, uh, I wonder what the Silva finish or inside the distance looks like. We see the fight pretty similar, man. You know, I, I think I could see it going a couple ways and it's Pennington decision with her bread and butter cage grappling um, she got a big experience edge as well. She's fought five rounds. She's fought for a title before. Um, Buena Silva's just very opportunistic, man, with her submissions. You know, um, she could be losing a lot of the minutes and, and snatch up a nasty sub. Whether it's against the cage, it's on the it's arm bar from guard like Stephanie Egger. Um, and I also think while they're at range, man, Buena Silva is landing, you know, way more damaging shots. Raquel – statistically speaking, not the best defense. She gets, she doesn't wear damage the best either. And watching back the home fight, you know, home started going to the clinch because Silva was landing on the feet. You know, I really thought home was going to have a massive edge there and it really didn't look like it. So I, I do think Silva's, I think Silva got the edge here on the feet by a pretty significant margin. And then like, kind of like we, I thought we talked about earlier, I do think if it goes to the mat, 
I think there's plenty of ways I can see her winning there. So I am on the on the Bueno Silva side. I, I just don't want to lay the chalk, man, here. She's – um, I've seen her completely get outstruck from a known Faro, just frustrated at range before as well. So sometimes I don't think the fight IQ is there for her. Sometimes I think she fights a bit emotionally, just trying to be the more physical girl. And Raquel, Raquel's made a living off being the more physical girl in the clinch. So uh, could be could be a close fight. Give me Bueno Silva to walk away with the finish, though, just like yourself. And Here's we make a, it to uh, yeah. A, a way that I could see playing this fight that I, I just looked up: uh, Raquel Pennington plus five and a half, minus one twenty. Like, okay. I think I think that she'll steal a round or two. I really do. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. At almost even money, that's I, I kind of like that. I was also looking at the Silva um, wins inside the distance. If it goes the distance, no action. But they've got that all the way up to minus five hundred. I mean, yeah. they understand there's just no finishing upside for Raquel mm-hmm. Pennington. Yeah. So the the plus five and a half, I think that, that that might be a spot that I look at just because I do. I think that Silva will give up a round. She'll just she can't find it to the ground and Raquel will be able to push her up against the cage for five minutes. Yeah. Hey, Raquel made it pretty much five rounds with Prime Amanda Nunes. So I think I think she can go five here as well, man. I like that. And then most heated uh title fight in a while, man. Sean Strickland, Drickus Duplessis. A lot of bad blood fighting in the crowd. Super excited for this one here, man. You know, I, I have one unit on Sean Strickland at minus 120. I don't typically like too much exposure in main event fights. Um, I do think a lot of times they're they're very closely played out fights here between, you know, very talented fighters. But give me the champ here with a, who's proven a whole lot more to me at minus 120. I was willing to roll the dice here. There's a few things I like with Sean Strickland. Um fact that the fight's five rounds, six of the last seven fights for Sean Strickland have been have been five rounds. He's been the main event numerous times. Where well, this is going to be a first for Duplessis, and Duplessis is one that we're always kind of seeing catch a second wind in his fight. Um, whereas Sean is a guy who I think can go 10 rounds, man. He just pretty much talks about sparring nonstop for his training. I think he's meant for these for this type of lifestyle, and, and ultimately I think there's just – a massive discrepancy in cardio here that goes to the champion's favor. Um, outside of Alex Preya, who is just one of the more technical guys, a win that's aging or a loss that's not aging poorly at all, and a, and a spinning back kick, Sean's been pretty damn durable over his career as well, man. Talk about path to victories. I, I think Duplessis is, I think Duplessis is TKO or bust. I don't really like his his process. You know, I. Is it the Darren Darren Till fight where he kind of he gets a I don't know if, would you call it takedowns cage time where he just kind of beats up on Till but other than that the guy's a primary striker looking to land a big a big KO and I don't really necessarily like that against Sean man I, I like Sean's volume I like his cardio I like his training situation I think that forward pressure that he has we could even see zap the gas tank of Duplessis even quicker and as as this fight continues to to go on. I think the later it goes, as it creeps toward championship rounds, I think it massively starts to swing in the champion's favor. I think that minus 120 is gone after the first round or two. I like Sean Strickland to walk away with his belt here, man. I know they're kind of gunning for Izzy and Duplessis, but I think they've I think they've missed out on it, man. And I, I think he's unsuccessful in his first title opportunity. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take Sean Strickland at minus 120. I think that's even getting up to around the minus 140, minus 135 range at this point. Um, what do you line this fight at, uh, rounds wise? I think it should be four and a half. I think, I think it is, what is it? Three and a half. It's and that's kind of, half. it's one and a half. Well, okay, well, yeah. well, it's one and a half, two and a half uh, right yeah. now on, on DraftKings over one and a half is minus two thirty. So it's not, so right. know, I think I was like, that's why I was looking at like, Minus three and a half is kind of where you you're getting close to the the minus one tens on the overs and unders, and I think that's the point where it kind of gets a little tricky. You know, um, I think that third round point is where we kind of start to see Duplessis fade, or is he going to have that second wind again? So, I'm I think the fight I think the fight could finish in championship rounds is what I'm getting at. So I, I do think I do think it's a bit tricky where it's sitting at. 
in my head, the only way that it finishes in championship rounds, though, is on the Sean side, you know, because of kind yeah. of the unanswered questions yeah. for Jerkis, where I almost feel like that three and a half or that three round mark is kind of, do you think Jerkis is going to win or do you think Sean's going to win? Um, you talked about the, Sean's pressure, and that certainly could be an issue come midway through that second round. But I do think that you'll get a better number on Sean um, after the first round. Drickus is, a, is is tough, man. Like, I think while he's got that first win and Sean's still trying to figure him out, Sean's kind of known to, even though he, he was able to catch Izzy in that first round, uh, he does like to download information. He does like to figure out, okay, how are these guys uh, mixing up their attacks and everything? And I, I do think that Drickus kind of lacks some... Uh, <laughs> so um, what am I trying to say? He, he's pretty, he's unique in the way that he approaches his entries and striking. And that might take a second for Sean to figure out um, his dur Sean's durability is held up outside of that Pereira fight. And I don't really think that Duplicy has that type of power, um, but he does have quite a bit of power. So if Sean can, you know, avoid the kill shot in that first round, round and a half. I do think that we start to see him take over, but that's a a big what if. And I think that Drickus, um, being as as unique of a striker as he is, and being as strong of a grappler he is, he doesn't necessarily have to have a lot of control time to be able to wrap up a submission and just squeeze it to death. Um, mm -hmm. I watched a couple of his grappling uh, highlights in like a. I forget what it was, like maybe a submission underground, but something like that. And he's just strong enough that if he's able to wrap up a, a submission, he can just squeeze it and you're going to end up tapping. It doesn't have to be the most technical of setups. Um, so I do think that he has a a little bit more of a finishing upside um, submission wise than Sean Strickland, although we don't really get to see much of Sean Strickland. I hear that he's pretty, pretty good on the ground, but we just don't get to see much of that. Um, if there's anybody shooting for takedowns, I expect it to be Drickus Duplessis. I'm, I'm probably going Sean with you. Um, and I think that he'll get it done in the later rounds as Duplessis, as he starts figuring out the attacks of Duplessis. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that he starts to pick him apart. So I'm with you on the Sean Strickland side. That's it. Nice to see you in agreement there. I know i got a lot of plays already out on Twitter. Keep an eye. Tyler will be throwing some out closer to fight time as well. Uh, it's 12 fights going down in Toronto. First pay-per-view of 2024. we got a week off after that. Then we're back at the Apex for Mavov and Delidze. Another another middle, middleweight Apex main event. Shocker. So we'll be back for that, man. I appreciate you guys hanging out with us. We'll see you next week. Peace.